Good evening to all. It's good to uh, be with everyone this evening, uh, whether you're here in this particular room or whether you're in our sound booth, that's what we're going to call it, the sound booth, or whether you are at home right now or maybe sitting in your car watching on your phone, which it's interesting the comments of where people have said they picked up the program. Uh, hey, I couldn't get home, so I was in my car someplace while my spouse was shopping or something like that. Or I was sitting down um, someplace at somebody's house in another state. So it's interesting the feedback that we get from all of that. Are we good in our sound booth? We're good? Okay. Okay, we're live streaming. Okay, we're just live streaming with a possible other thing. Okay. So um, uh, one announcement to make tonight is that Raul has requested prayers for his brother. Uh, he's had some struggles with depression, and things are kind of uh, ebbing and flowing with him. He has good days and bad days, and has asked for us to uh, go to God in prayer on his behalf. So we want to remember Raul's brother. Um, and so uh, uh, now there are others who have asked for prayers. And we want to remember everyone um, and uh, do the best we can to keep in contact and keep in touch with each other uh, and help people avoid everything from uh, uh, any, the loneliness that is often going around. Also, uh, if, if we can um, help anybody out physically and, of course, spiritually, uh, we're here for you as well. All right, this, uh, this evening we're going to look at a topic of challenges. And before we begin this topic, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here this evening. We thank you for your word to give us the guidance and the plan for our lives. We ask you to help us, to help us to look to your word, to trust in you, and to, and to be the people that you want us to be. We ask you, Father, to help us to meet life's challenges, help us to face them, and to lean upon you for the strength to get through them. We ask, Father, that you be with Raul's brother and, and help him in his struggles, as, as many of us oftentimes go through uh, either different times in our life or sometimes chronically we go through anxieties and periods of depression to where um, the human body and the human mind just go through uh, these, these deep struggles. We ask, Father, that you be with us and help us at this time to rely upon you and to rely upon one another. We thank you for, again for this study that we're about to have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, so challenges. We want to go through challenges and how we face, not just, you know, meeting challenges, but the idea that we embrace challenges, that we run towards challenges. You see, there's, there's very much a natural tendency that we have to where oftentimes we want to take that, that path of least resistance. We want to, we kind of gravitate towards the easy thing because well the easy thing is easier and who really wants to go towards the harder thing when there's an easier way well sometimes we see that in life uh, the easy way may not always be the best way and so what we want to do is uh, to look at challenges and to not shirk away from them or or to go a different direction just because something is difficult and hard but oftentimes the case is to actually accept the challenge or look for new challenges where we can use our abilities and use our time to take something head on to where we can be uh, God's instrument in teaching others and being an example and helping others and not just thinking, well, that's, that's kind of hard. That's too hard for me to use. You know, there is a certain eight-year-old child, I won't mention her name, that I spend a lot of time with regularly. And, you know, you can always get those cool pappy points by doing things like setting up an obstacle course. There's probably many of those uh, here or watching that have done an obstacle course before. And you remember as a kid, it was always a challenge to do that. Well, I set up, I think this was my best one ever. I know you got to visualize this because I didn't bring any pictures. So you started out on this obstacle course that I made earlier this week by running across the paving stones. Of course, the paving stones were like alligator heads. So you had to run across all the, uh, I think there was about 20 of them. So little tiny footsteps all the way across there. Go around the shed. Climb up Mount Mulch, which was about a dozen, 15 bags of mulch. You had to climb up that and get over the other side. 
And then, probably not the best thing to do, but there was a, about a six-foot ladder. You had to go up the ladder and down the other side. That was a little tricky one because the toes can get caught in the ladder. But then you got to go through the tomatoes, around by the pond, underneath a board where you have to squat, around the bird feeders. Then you got to go and step on one bale of hay, jump across to the other bale of hay, and then go through the bamboo, bamboo straight from Miss Aloma's form, go around the bamboo in a zigzag fashion. Go around the bamboo, go around the fig tree then. Then go underneath the pear tree, ring the wind chime without touching a single pear. If you touch the pear at this point, you're totally disqualified and your time does not count. So all the pears that are bountifully hanging off the pear tree cannot be touched. Then you got to go and step on the bench, jump off, and then get back on the original starting point. I was pretty impressive. I was excited to do that. So she did it two or three times. Make it harder. It's like, okay. Make it harder. So I spread the hay bales a little bit further. Put a couple extra bags of mulch on. Did that two or three times. The times were getting slower, so that's like, you know, pat on the old back thinking, ah, you're going to sleep good tonight. Running around, make it harder. It's like, oh, make it harder. I'm scratching my head. Oh, I got one. Get four by four posts, lay it down. You got to go across the balance beam, put some pears underneath the tree on the ground, take some off the tree. You can't touch the pears on the ground or on the tree, so you got to super concentrate. Two or three more times, make it harder. The best thing was go inside and get a 12 pound medicine ball that she had to do part of the course with. That was kind of fun to watch. <laughs> Too hard. Okay, you do that, and it's interesting, make it harder. Even when you can barely jump from one bale of hay to another bale of hay. Or the mulch is getting so hard it get, get, barely can get up without sliding off. Make it harder. Isn't it fascinating that kids do that? You know, when was the last time that any of us, we, we went to work and we're there and the boss gives us something to do and we're getting our job and, we're, and we've maybe been there a year or two and you're, you're really efficient and things are a lot moving quicker than they have in the past. And you go to your boss, you say, you know, it's just getting too easy. I need you to make my job harder. I want you to make my week harder. I need more hours. I'm, I'm getting this done too quick. Do we, do we even think like that? Make it harder. So we want to accept these challenges. And you learn a lot from a kid who, just, who wants to meet challenges and they want to do more and they want to do something else. They, they kind of thrive on challenges. And so we, we don't want to shy away from these things. You know, at different times of life, though, challenges may change. Sometimes we may need a break from challenges. We may need to recuperate, rejuvenate ourselves. Other times we need to, a different challenge on something. But our, but our key is we should not continue and continue to go the other direction. Always like, you know, I just, too hard. I need it easier. I need to scale back and more back, and more back, and well, well I, this is too hard, and I, and I can't do this work for the Lord. We never should say, especially in spiritual matters, you know what, Lord, I'm done. Forget the obstacles in my way. Forget the obstacle course. Forget the challenges. I've met the challenges for 10 years or 50 years, and, and you know what? I'm, I'm kind of I'm done with it all. In Isaiah chapter 6, we have the text where, you know, the, the famously in the midst of the, what we're going to read, where he says, here I am or here am I, send me. Accepting the challenge that is before him. Now, when we think of so many people in the Bible, what we see is there's so many of them who look now that we've got enough, plenty of examples where people are like, uh-uh, not me, going the other direction, or that's too hard, or I can't do that, or woe is me, or who am I? But we also see the times where people stepped up, either because God asked them to, follow me, what Jesus said, or because they saw a need and they decided, I can't let this stand, I have to take action. That's the people we want to be. Not the ones who we see a need and somebody says, well, somebody really needs to do something about that. 
or not my job, or hopefully that gets taken care of, or you know what? Somebody should really take up that challenge. That would be a good work for somebody, except me. So we want to be cautious and not shy away. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 1, says, In that year, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. So, the question goes out, who will go for this in this vision? And amongst this, he says, here I am. Send me. I, I can do this job. You know, isn't it great? Um, and it's, it's watching kids again. And I'm putting myself in with all the older folks because I know, what, I, know I do the same thing. If there's somebody like sitting in this room right now, and I'm in one of the chairs, and the teacher says... Who would like to read? My hand is not the first one to go up. Pause. Look around. Thinking, I hope somebody else jumps in and reads here. Well, okay, maybe. And maybe you are. Maybe you're one of those people that you're ready to do it as soon as somebody says there's a need. I know a lot of times I'm not. I know sometimes with kids in a classroom, not every one of them, but the majority, you ask a question, simply, you know, let's use the same example, who wants to read? I'm like, oh, okay, uh, uh, and you, okay, you start, and then you're next. I didn't get to read. You get done, and like, but I didn't get to. Okay. Sports team. Who wants to come and, and show how this plays run? you're going to get a bunch of hands go up. So we learn a lot from the enthusiasm of children, their desire, their, their wanting to, maybe they, maybe they want to show their talent that they got, maybe, but, but they want to do something. And it's you know, good for us to get that back, a little bit of that zeal. So if there is a need to try to, because tra it's training, because we kind of like unlearn it, again, that path of least resistance, to where when there's a need, we're like, I got it. I'll take it on. You can count on me. Here I am. Send me. Here's the message, though. This is, this is interesting as we look at this. So we're not going to just end on that one. Let's keep reading. Um, Here I am. Send me. And he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. That is like the most depressing picture. The idea is, this is what you're going to tell these people. And they're not going to hear. They're not going to see. They're not going to get what it is that your message is. That's miserable to say, well, 
you're going to teach them this lesson until they all understand, until they're ready to follow you and they're ready to listen to my voice and they're ready to make their lives right. And you're thinking, okay, that's going to be a great work. That's a great ministry. Nope, that's not what he gets. They're not going to listen. And their hearts are going to be closed. Their eyes are closed. Their ears are closed. And he's asked the obvious question, how long? How long do I do this? Now, in modern terminology, because it seems to be the standard everywhere, the modern summary phrase, this is an obvious paraphrase, not in the Bible anywhere. But if somebody said this description, they'd say, until the zombie apocalypse. That's kind of like the modern phrase you hear all the time when there's going to be disaster. The zombie apocalypse. You hear it all the time. So, uh, that's the description. The city, until the cities are lying in waste. There's houses without people. The Lord takes people. There's a tenth of it remain. Things are going to be burned. There's stumps. Until there's nothing left. Because nobody's going to listen to the word you say. That's how long I need you to carry this message. That's what he's gotten himself into by volunteering. So sometimes by volunteering, it's not, oh, this is great. I'm going to do this wonderful work and everybody's going to be happy with me. Sometimes it goes the opposite direction. And the work needs done, and the effort needs made, but maybe it's not the results that we would like. It does not mean that we're a failure. It means that we've made the attempt, that we've tried. That's what's pleasing to the Lord. We hope that we can see fruit and success, but that's not always the case. If you've ever seen, I know, I know some of you have seen this, um, Anybody of the few folks who are here, a head nod if you've ever seen the Veggie Tales show, Lord of the Beans. Anybody seen that one? Lord of the Beans. Lord of the Beans is a spinoff, knockoff of Lord of the Rings. And there's a magic bean. And the magic bean will grant the owner of the bean anything he wants. The whole theme of this was like a special Veggie Tale, and it's like 30 or 40 minutes long. Yeah, the magic bean, and it's funny because all of the Lord of the Rings characters are in there in a humorous way. I like, I like Lego Lamb the best. He's pretty funny. Um, but these, the, the main lesson in this VeggieTales movie is the life of ease. And the person who had the bean for decades upon decades got everything they wanted, even an espresso maker. And he just lives this life of ease, and that's what he has. But it's ruined him because he's not had to do anything. He's not had to work or anything. He's not had, there's everything he's wanted, he's just wished for, and it's appeared. And that's kind of the whole theme about this danger of just living for material things, living for your own self, being selfish about what you have, and always taking, of course, that easy way. If you haven't watched it, watch. It's pretty entertaining. The challenges before us, though, they take effort. The parable of the talents that Jesus taught was one about the instruction of do. Do something. Take it upon yourself and use the resources, abilities, talents, skills, knowledge that you have. Don't do what the one talent man did and be motivated by fear and bury that talent. And then when the master asks what has come of it, you say, I know you're, you're, you know, you, you, you reap where you've not sown and you're, you're a tough master. And, and I just, I was afraid, so I hid it in the ground. It's not what the master expected. It wasn't a valuable use of the resources that he was given. Let's look over in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So, taking up our cross does take effort. It is an action that has to be taken. The idea of, okay, now, how can I take up my cross, one, and how can I follow Jesus, two, without really having to do anything. If we're asking that, we're definitely asking the wrong questions. Because we want to know, what does that mean to take up our cross? 
And what does that mean to follow Jesus? It is not something that can happen passively or without thought or without effort. And so the challenges that are before us take effort, to, it takes initiative to make happen. And so we want to do things. You know, from, from Moses taking up the challenge to free and lead a people at age 80, to David as a youth going up against Goliath, the people of God who are approved by God are those who take up the challenges. It might be a big event. I mean, both David and Moses were you know, pretty big leaders. But it could also be something small. It could, all, it could be something as, uh, as helping somebody out, bearing a burden, praying with somebody, uh, you know, putting a hand on a shoulder, being a shoulder to cry on. Uh, it could be those kind of things. There's a lot that we can do to meet what God expects us to do. Speaking of David, let's turn over for the last bit of our lesson and look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, we're going to start in verse 19. 1 Samuel 17, verse 19. Not usually where we start when we're looking at this with David and Goliath, but we're going to start in uh, verse 19 tonight. 17, verse 19. Now Saul and, and they... Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he went to the encampment as the host was going out to battle, the battle line shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with him, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistine and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. You know, when we look at this account, there's a, there's a couple fascinating things here. One, of course, the obvious one, is that David, who's described as a youth, decides to take it upon himself because of his belief in God and that God has delivered him before from a lion and the bear, that God is going to be with him as he goes to face the giant. He's got to face his challenge head on. Nobody asked him to. Nobody said, hey, come on, go, Dave. You, you, you got this. God didn't say, I need a champion. David saw the need, and he took initiative and he's going to meet that need. But the other thing I really want to focus on tonight is not just facing the enemy. Because the enemy sometimes is obvious. Maybe it's the enemy of, of fear or the enemy of our own self-doubt. Or maybe it's whoever it is that's in opposition. Or maybe somebody's persecuting Christians in some way. And we have to meet that challenge and not be afraid of what the world throws at us. But David also had to overcome something else. Listen to this next part of the reading. David also had to overcome his family. He had to overcome the others who were in the, his midst. He even had to overcome the king, an ally, friendly territory, to be able to go and face the giant. Because he was told, you can't do this. I know what motivates you to do this. Here's how I would do this. And he's given all of these things, either told, you know, questioning his motivation, questioning his commitment, questioning his ability to do it, and then even give, being given advice of how it needs to happen. And he's like, I can't do it this way. So think about that as we read the rest of this, starting in verse 28. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. 
And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him towards another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. So his brother, others, they're like, there's evil questioning the reasons for why he wants to do what he thinks and he's done. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're but a youth, and he's been a man of war from his youth. So now the head, the, the person with the greatest authority in the land is telling him, you can't do this. It's not possible for you to do this. And with Saul, he's thinking, youth, warrior, giant, not giant. He's like, you can't do it, and just telling him. But David doesn't listen to his brother. He doesn't listen to the other people. He doesn't listen to Saul. He feels like he knows what needs to be done. David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear and I took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, will deliver me. From the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go and the Lord be with you. So Saul must have, at the very least, Saul may have thought, Well, I don't have anything to lose. But at the most, maybe Saul thought, Well, maybe he can do something. Remember, Saul wasn't completely right with God himself. But Saul is going to allow this to happen. But then, of course, now that Saul's changed his tune and said, well, he's a warrior and you're just a youth, it's changed a little bit. And this is what he says in verse 38. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head, clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped a sword over his armor. He tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. So sometimes then, if you got people who say, oh, you're, you're trying to do this, you're trying to, maybe, maybe it's the work of the Lord. You're trying to do this work, or you're trying to take this stance, or you're trying to stand up for this, what is right. I know what you're doing. You're doing to make a name for yourself. Or you're, you're doing this just, uh, uh, you know, because this is that you want to show people, or you want to just challenge, or you want whatever. No, that's not what he was doing. Or the idea is, you can't do this. You don't have the ability to do this. And we hear other people, the people that were supposed to should have been close to him and encouraging him, tell him he can't. Then he goes a little bit further, and finally they go, okay, well, if, you, if you're determined to do this, here, let me tell you how to do it. So the same people who said you can't do it, are they really the ones to give advice and say, well, since you're going to do it, let me tell you how it needs to happen. And that's the ones that are trying to give him advice now. Very ones that just said he couldn't go for it. And David said, I can't do this. It says, then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the brook, put them in his shepherd's pouch, a sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. That's all the farther we're going to go in the reading. But you see what he did. He met the challenge. He accepted it. He saw a need that needed to be taken something that needed to be done. And he said, I'm going to take care of this. I trust God to be with me. He went against the, his own brother who said that he had a sinful heart and he had motivation. Uh, or he went to just watch the battle. Then he, the other men who are around him, so you got multiple people who are challenging. And that's hard to stand up to the crowds. And yet alone, then he's in front of the king and the king says, you can't do it. And he's got to, you know, I beg to differ. I'm going to do it. And then the people who doubt him say, okay, this is what you need to happen. We're going to suit you up and give you armor. They say, I can't do that. God's with me. 
takes his stones, takes his sling, and he goes out and he approached the Philistine. He went out and met the challenge before him. That's, that's what we need to do, is not just meeting a challenge, not necessarily just being ready for the challenge, but sometimes based on the needs of what we see, running towards the challenge, embracing it and taking it upon ourselves to do what needs to do to overcome the obstacles that we face today. If you are in need of the Lord's invitation, if you're ready to put Christ on in baptism and have your sins washed away, and you understand who Jesus Christ is, he's the Son of God, that he went to the cross and died, was buried, and rose again, and you're ready to repent of wrong and be baptized into his name, uh, if you're here tonight and that is your need, then after the, we finish the closing prayer, we'll get together and we'll study. And if you're a person who is watching this and would like to have a Bible study, then please contact us and we'll study with you. At this time, we will have a closing prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to meet here tonight. Lord, we thank you for those in attendance here and those who are watching from home. We ask that you be with us as we are still going through this pandemic, Lord, and it seems like the numbers are even increasing still today. And we ask that you be with us, be with this nation, help us to stay safe and to be vigilant and to take the precautions necessary to keep ourselves and our families away from this virus. Lord, we ask that you be with the doctors and the nurses and those treating those who are sick. We ask that you be with this country as we still have some unrest and help us to know the right things to do and the right things to say to get through this together and help us to remember that we're all your children and that you love us and we love each other and that every soul is important. Lord, be with us tonight as we leave this place. Go with us through the rest of this week. Keep us safe. Forgive us for our sins. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.